Today, this podcast is being recorded on Gadigal land. We pay our respects to the traditional custodians of this country and elders past and present. We extend that respect to any First Nations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. You're listening to Sex Talk with Amy. I'm Amy Davidson, and I'm here to candidly confront all the sex-related topics you've been curious about. So let's get stuck into it. Hello, hello, my sexy daredevils, and welcome to episode 15 of Sex Talk with Amy. Today, I'm going to be dishing the dirt on my craziest, cringiest Tinder dating stories and answering your submitted questions. But before we get stuck into all of that, I just want to brag for a second about my little success moment that came to fruition over the last couple of weeks, baby. So please indulge me for a moment while I tell you that Apple Podcasts added Sex Talk with Amy to their new and noteworthy charts. Front page, baby, front page. That's right. We're making moves out here, and it's all because of literally you guys. You guys have been listening, streaming, downloading, commenting, sharing, coming, squirting, crying, screaming, all of it. And I couldn't be more grateful, honestly. So if you're an OG listener who's been here from day one, thank you. Or if this is your first episode tuning in and you've just found out about the podcast, welcome. Welcome to my humble abode of absolute filth. I'm excited to have you here. I hope you have a good time and let's see how far we can push this little one woman show. Anyway, enough sucking your dicks and licking your clits. Let's get stuck into my Tinder stories. I want to start with the most outrageous and then work my way backwards. So my first Tinder story dates back to November 2021. So pretty soon after the lockdown restrictions were lifted for vaccinated people. So bars, clubs, restaurants, music venues back in full swing. And for the sake of anonymity, we're going to call this guy the racist wedding singer. So I met up with this guy who I'd been chatting with on Tinder. He was in his mid to late 20s, tall, dark and handsome, musician, wedding performer, all that. So we met up for dinner at this beautiful restaurant in Sydney, CBD. Very dark, candlelit, nice music, romantic vibes, lots of young couples. It was a good spot for a first date, which he picked out, so props to him for that at least. Anyway, the first half hour or so was not too bad. Um, He seemed like a nice guy. We had stuff in common, good banter. So from the jump, pretty good first impression. But it all went downhill from there. So pretty soon into dinner, he dropped the first red flag, which was his crazy ex. Quote unquote crazy, according to him. Now, here's the thing. Talking about your ex on a first date in any context is a red flag in my book. Now, obviously, when you meet someone new, you have no idea what they're going through in their life. Some people in the dating game are fresh out of a breakup, out of a long-term relationship. They're still hurting. They're still thinking about their ex. And yeah, that sucks. Yeah, that's an awful feeling. But if you're putting yourself back out there and meeting up with new people, can you please, for the love of God, just put that shit aside for one night? Like if I'm going out, trying to have a good time, meet a new guy, see if we vibe, the last thing I need is him ranting about an ex-partner all night, going on about how horrible she supposedly was, even though he dated her for four and a half years. And I don't even know this woman. But here's the thing though, with this guy in particular, he took it a step further, okay? He not only brought up his crazy ex, he brought up his crazy Russian ex. His words, not mine. So not only was he majorly giving off the toxic vibe of all my ex-girlfriends are crazy and I'm just a nice guy who's been unlucky in love, but in the same breath, he also managed to be racist. Now, the super ironic part about this story is that this man later on in the night talked about how he hates being racially profiled and discriminated against for his background and how that's been affecting him in the workplace, even though he literally did the same thing to someone else, not once, but twice during this night. And the second time, of course, involves another story about a crazy ex. Surprise, surprise, because let's face it, it's not enough for these self-proclaimed nice guys to have one crazy ex. They generally have multiple stories, right? So this time he talked about a woman he was in a relationship with briefly after the woman who was Russian. And this was quite a fresh breakup for him. And this particular woman was a nurse who had migrated here from China. And according to him, she was emotionally needy, which bothered him because he was quite busy with work and 
couldn't see her or talk to her as often as she wanted him to. And he told this one particular story where she came to a gig that he was playing at. And at the end of his set, she was helping him pack up and she accidentally dropped a microphone or a speaker or something like that. It was some expensive piece of gear, apparently. And I don't remember if he said anything happened to it or not, but basically she said, I'm really sorry, picked it up, put it back in his bag and didn't make a big deal out of it. Now, he didn't like this, apparently, this attitude of hers. He had an issue with her reaction because he felt like she wasn't panicking enough. She didn't seem remorseful enough or phased enough, and he wanted her to be more frantic or something. <laughs> now, obviously, I wasn't there to know what really happened or whether she was genuinely sorry or not or if there was any damage done, so I can only make assumptions here, but it sounds pretty emotionally manipulative to me from his end. Like, she accidentally dropped something while she was trying to help you. She apologized. She put it back, which honestly makes it sound like nothing probably did happen. And I get that music gear is expensive and it's essential for your job, so that can be upsetting. But the way he said that he wanted her to act more sorry really rubbed me the wrong way. Like he wasn't satisfied with the calm apology. He wanted her to panic. And I kind of feel like that's gaslighty and weird. Like what was he expecting her to do? get on her knees and grovel like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, babe. Oh my God, I can't believe I dropped your microphone. Ugh, I'm such a hopeless klutz. I don't deserve an amazing man like you. Here, let me get on my knees and suck your dick and swirl my tongue around your cock until I shape out all the letters to I'm sorry. Seriously, dude, is that what you want? because it fucking sounds like it. Anyway, after this supposed incident, a fight broke out between them at the venue, instigated by him, of course, because she didn't look sorry enough to him. And then during the car ride back to his place, he started telling her, you know, maybe I should just drop you back at your house tonight. I feel like I need some space to cool down and think about things. And basically just started giving her the cold shoulder, which again, classic narcissistic move of icing someone out as emotional punishment. Anyway, it's at this point that she starts to grovel, which let's face it, that's what he's been waiting for right? To break her down and exhaust her emotionally, make her feel like she's not good enough until she finally gives him the reaction he wants so he can feel important again. Yay! So she starts saying stuff like, please don't drop me home. Let's just go back to your place and talk. I really am sorry. Please don't do this. Just give me another chance and all that sort of stuff. And this is when the racism stuff comes in again. Because remember how I said this woman migrated here from China? Well, as he's reciting the things that she was saying to him in the car while she was crying, he was mimicking her foreign accent and making all of these like strange faces as well. Like literally making fun of her with racial implications. Insane, insane. And there he was just before this story, talking about how he hates people putting stereotypes on him just because of his racial background. Like, it never ceases to amaze me just how not self-aware some people are. Like, they're a walking contradiction. They're always the victim. They're self-proclaimed nice guys who genuinely believe that they're such a great catch, even though they're perpetually single, going out on dates telling the same stories about the same crazy women who did them wrong, even though, mind you, both of these women from these two stories I just told are now happily married. Go figure and his ass is still single, talking about how crazy these women apparently are. And with the second girlfriend, I haven't even gotten to the craziest part of the story yet. So at some point during this car ride, things escalated. She was groveling for him to give her a second chance. And he was saying stuff like, I don't feel like you take my music career seriously. My gear means a lot to me. Still talking about the gear. All cause she dropped a microphone or something, like get over it. Anyway, he's going off at her. And according to him at this point, while the car was in motion on a main road in a middle lane, this chick flung the door open and just walked out just walked out of the car, ran off. This woman is a nurse, a nurse. Like if anyone's gonna know what happens to people who jump out onto the road, it's probably gonna be her, right? Cause let's face it, she's probably treated a few of them in hospital for fuck's sake. Anyway, at this point, this guy starts chuckling as he recalls how he watched her almost get hit by a car that was approaching in the lane next to them as she ran across and barely made it onto the sidewalk. You absolute fucking psycho. How is it funny, first of all, when your girlfriend almost dies because she's that desperate to get away from you? Puts her life on the line because she's that desperate to get away from you. Do you hear yourself? Do you honestly think this story makes you look good? Aren't you embarrassed to be that intolerable that women are jumping from moving cars to get away from you? Dude, 
You seriously thought this was a killer first date story? I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad he told it because then at least I knew who I was dealing with, but still, imagine being that unaware of yourself. But that's the thing with people like this, right? They're never in the wrong. They're never in the wrong. They'll drive someone to the point of acting crazy and doing some out of character shit, and then they'll step back, point the finger and be like, see, she's nuts. But conveniently, they'll leave out all the fucking parts where they did and said the most twisted, unhinged things for months that drove them to the point of being like, you know what? That's it. I'm getting out of here right now. I'm getting out of this moving car right now because I can't stand to be around you for one second longer. You racist, sexist weirdo. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I'd block this story out of my memory for a while because of just how pissed off it made me, but something recently triggered it all back, baby. So picture this. It's February. I'm sitting on the couch. I turn on the TV. I'm flicking through the channels. Ooh, Australian Idol. Ooh, there's Amy Shark. There's Megan Trainer. Ooh, there's someone walking into audition. Guess who it fucking is? Yep, it's the racist wedding singer. This motherfucker was auditioning for Australian Idol. Anyway, he did get in. He did then get booted out pretty early on in the competition, I believe. And he's back now singing at weddings, posting quotes on Instagram like, love is love, love is love. Motherfucker, what do you know about love? Seriously? Yikes. This next story is about a Tinder match that we're gonna call Hot Dog Nathan. And it's about as ridiculous and unhinged as it sounds. So this one dates back to 2017. I was starting the first official week of my new uni course after orientation week. It was late at night. I was flicking through Tinder profiles until I landed on Nathan. Obviously this guy's real name isn't Nathan, but that's what we're gonna call him. So Nathan's profile was interesting to me because he had that stereotypical bad boy look about him that I quite frankly still haven't grown out of. So we're talking leather jacket, motorbike, guitar, gelled hair, ripped denim jeans, dirty but clean looking at the same time. Anyway, his main profile picture, I'll never forget, was him standing in front of his Harley Davidson, which looked like it was parked out in the middle of nowhere, like he was on a road trip surrounded by cornfields or something. He had this zipped up leather biker jacket on. He had his sunglasses on top of his greasy head. He was holding his helmet off to his side, like next to his hip. And he had these beautiful pearly white teeth, hazel eyes, and this kind of crooked grin on his face. And I know it sounds extremely douchey, the whole thing, the way I'm describing this photo, but somehow he was pulling it off, like it was working for him. Unfortunately though, he did turn out to be as douchey in real life as the photo I'm describing. So the funny thing about Nathan is that but he actually turned out to be my classmate. So we matched on Tinder that night, talked a little bit before I fell asleep, nothing crazy, just small talk. And then the next morning, I'm at my 9 a.m. lecture. It's a Monday morning, pretty dead. I'm watching like a few people sleepily roll into class and guess who fucking walks in? It's Nathan. And he's got his helmet with him, the same helmet from the photo. I was shooketh. Anyway, he clocks me. He locks eyes with me, his eyes widen for a minute, and then he kind of relaxes into this awkward smile of, oh, I know who you are. And we both have this kind of embarrassing, unspoken moment of like, holy fuck, my Tinder match goes to uni with me. So anyway, he sits a few rows in front of me next to his two mates. And in the middle of class, messages me on Tinder like, lol, how funny is this? And I'm like, I know, right? And he's like, do you wanna hang out after? Are you free after this? And that particular semester, I had about four hours to kill on a Monday before my Arvo tutorial because my timetable was cooked. And it's not like I lived nearby or anything to like go chill at home and come back. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm free. Let's, let's hang out. So after the lecture, he waited for me outside while I packed up all my shit. And then we went to the cafe next door to the building, got coffee, sat, talked. And I think at some point I said something along the lines of, I like your motorbike. And he was like, wanna ride it? And I was like, what now? And he's like, yeah, let's go for a ride. So we go into the alleyway where he's parked his bike. He's got a spare helmet for me. He helps me adjust it. It was a very cute moment, kind of like that scene between um, Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson in How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Anyway, this is how stupidly trusting I was. I literally didn't even ask him where we're going. Like, where the fuck are you taking me right now? 
I literally just hop on and he rides off. Anyway, he ends up pulling up in front of Harry's Cafe de Wheels at Woolamaloo Wharf. And we get our hot dogs and we sit by the wharf overlooking the water. And we're just eating and talking and getting to know each other. He's being really funny, which I like. And he's telling me all these stories about his family and his friends and stuff. The sun is blinding my eyes. There's tomato sauce on the side of my face. But I didn't really give a fuck because I'm a messy bitch like that. And we were vibing. Anyway, I'm wiping sauce off the side of my face with a napkin and he looks at me and he just pauses for a bit and he smiles and I'm like, what? What are you looking at? And he goes, you look really beautiful with your hair tied up like that. And then he leans in and gives me a kiss. And it was not a bad kiss. It was a very sweet, closed mouth first kiss. No tongue, no lip biting, just a nice peck on the lips. Then what happened really fucked this up. So he'd gotten through about half of his hot dog and then he looked down at it and he was like, well, I'm full. Then he stared out at the rocks near the water and there was a pigeon there just chilling on the rocks. And it was kind of hobbling around and walking really slowly like it was wounded or something. And then all of a sudden, before my mind could even process what the fuck was happening, he turned to me with this like sly grin on his face and he went, check this out and he fucking pegged that hot dog full force, aiming it at the pigeon and struck the pigeon. Like what the fuck? Literally struck it down. And then he started laughing about it, like hardcore laughing, throwing his head back, deep belly laughs. He was pointing at the bird like, gotcha. He was so proud of himself for hitting this bird with a hot dog that he turned to me and he was like, Did you see that? Like, I'm supposed to be impressed or something. And I'm thinking, yeah, I did. You fucking psychopath. I did see that, unfortunately. You psycho. And I'm looking around, nervous giggling, because I don't know how to, like, conduct myself around this guy anymore. And I see two full-grown men, like, in their 40s probably, standing in the corner near the hot dog place, and they're glaring at us. Like, they're glaring. They're glaring at me just as much as they're glaring at him, because they think I'm with this guy, and I condoned that shit. Anyway, I'm looking back at them like, please do not loop me in with this motherfucker. I want to get out of there as soon as possible. So I make up some bullshit about needing to go back to uni early before my tutorial starts because I need to borrow a textbook from the library or some shit. So we walk over to his bike, put our helmets on. He sits in the driver's position first, starts revving his bike, and I swing my leg around to hop on the back and he inches his bike forward before I've taken a seat and I almost topple over. And I'm standing there with my arms out like this in disbelief, trying to regain my balance after thinking he was about to take off without me. And I'm thinking, surely that must've been an accident, right? Like maybe he thought I already sat down, but as it turns out, he was actually fucking with me, this guy. So I go to sit down again, like, haha, very funny. Let's actually get the fuck out of here now. And he does it again. I'm about to sit my ass down and he inches forward at the last minute, quickly pumps the brakes and then turns over and starts laughing at me. Honestly, at this point, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, okay, I've never been in this area before. I just want to get back to uni. I don't have a lot of money on me and I don't necessarily want to hang around out here by myself. So let me just get on this fucking bike. I'll only have to tolerate this guy for another 10 to 15 minutes and then we'll be back at uni. So I finally get on the bike, we take off, I'm holding on to him for dear life as he zips through traffic like a lunatic. We park back in the alleyway where we were at before, right next to the uni building and I kid you not, I got off that bike so quick. I took my helmet off so quick and just shoved it in his hands and went like, thank you, awkwardly, and then just started brisk walking back to the uni building. And he was all like, wait up, what's the rush? Like coming after me, not picking up on my body language language at all, which clearly showed that I was pissed with him. And honestly, I was only like 20 years old at the time. And I was unfortunately in my people pleasing, non-confrontational era. And not only that, but me and this guy, we were both doing the same uni course, which was a one year accelerated diploma course. So I was thinking to myself, if I go off at this guy and really give him a piece of my mind and tell him to just leave me the fuck alone, he might end up making the rest of this year really fucking difficult for me. So I kind of decided to brush him off as gently as I possibly could because with weird dudes like this, there's nothing more fragile than their ego, right? Once they feel butt hurt by a girl rejecting them, they get aggro. And that's exactly what happened, but not for a few weeks. Anyway, I kind of started acting cold towards him and giving him like short answers after that. He even tried calling me a couple of times because he wanted to hang out again. And just like I said in the first story with the racist wedding singer, it never ceases to amaze me. Just how not self-aware some people are. Like, Jesus, were you there? 
Did you not see what you did to that bird? Because I was there and it was fucked. But for some reason, you genuinely think I would want a second date with you. Anyway, six months down the track into my uni course, him and his mates had gotten, I guess, tired of picking on me because maybe Nathan's masculine ego felt, you know, sufficiently restored by that point. But incidentally, we both ended up actually applying for the same business scholarship. Surprise, surprise, turns out Nathan's more studious than he looks. Anyway, we were both selected as finalists, at which point I beat him, of course, and ended up getting the scholarship because let's face it, I was not going to let them give it to a bloody pigeon hitter. And that was the end of that. His ego was crushed again, but this time it was so bad. He didn't say another word to me or even look in my direction till we graduated. Thank God. Anyway, Nathan, if you're listening to this, please get help. Um, I hope you're feeling more secure in yourself these days to the point where you don't need to throw hot dogs at pigeons or harm any living creature for that matter to prove your masculinity. And yeah, don't mess with women on your motorbike. You know, you're not 12 years old, mate. It's not funny to tell a woman to get on your bike and then pretend you're going to take off without them. So grow up. Thank you. So my third Tinder story is called Slut Shamer Steve. And this one happened back in 2018, the year after Nathan. And surprise, surprise, Slut Shamer Steve was also a leather wearing biker. So definitely appeared to have a type there. And funnily enough, after we matched on Tinder and got to talking, I realized that I knew who his parents were because I'd just helped them sell their house that Steve grew up in. Because at the time I was actually working in real estate. I was a sales associate, which is so random. I know, crazy. Anyway, he met up with me outside my work building in the city one night. He'd made dinner reservations in Darling Harbor. So we went, had dinner. It was a lovely time. Then we got on his bike and went to Frankie's for drinks. RIP Frankie's, by the way. I don't remember who was playing that night, but we had a great time. Then we went to this arcade place. I can't remember which one it was, probably because I was pretty tipsy at this point, but I'm pretty sure it was within walking distance from Frankie's, if that place is still even around. But yeah, we played some games. We played air hockey for ages. By this point, it's getting pretty late. We go outside for a smoke. We go just for a little walk around the block and we talked about everything. We talked about our jobs, our friends, our families and high school and dating. And this is when he drops the red flag. He's mid-sentence talking about some chick he dated in high school and then he ever so casually, without a second thought, goes, So I had this girlfriend in high school and she was such a slut. (gasps) I was so disappointed, so disappointed. Cause this night was so close to being perfect. This guy was so close to being a green flag in my books, but then he had to come crumbling down with the old slut shaming antics. Honestly, guys who in this day and age still casually throw around the word slut as an insult, as a way to critique the way a woman chooses to express her sexuality is beyond disgusting to me. It's an instant turn off, instant turn off. And again, I was still sort of in my people pleasing, non confrontational era at this time. I was doing better with it than I was with Nathan, but I wasn't even close to where I'm at now. So I ghosted him after that night. I only reached out one more time to cancel the second date we had planned. I never told him why. I never told him what it was that made me upset and I cut him off. I stopped responding to his messages after that. Another thing that really baffled me about this whole situation was that after our date, I told some female friends of mine what happened and some of them kind of defended him or at least thought that I was over exaggerating and that I didn't give this guy enough of a chance and I shouldn't write him off because of one thing he said. And one of them even said, you know, maybe that one girl he was talking about, maybe she was a slut. (gasps) Sorry? I'm sorry, what? Like, what's your point there? Because here's my viewpoint on that whole situation. If a person is comfortable slipping that word into conversation so casually as an insult towards one particular woman, there's nothing stopping them from saying that or thinking that about you or your sister or your friends, really any woman in your life, because it goes to show what they really think deep down about women who are promiscuous or sex positive or whatever it is that they're viewing in their mind, in their psyche, in a negative light. So looking back on that whole scenario, do I regret cutting him off? No, no, I don't. But But I do regret not having a conversation because unfortunately, people aren't mind readers, right? 
It would definitely make things easier sometimes if people were, but they're not. And I don't know what I was so afraid of at that time, but I guess that was my toxic trait during that season of my life. Someone would say something to me or do something to me that would hurt my feelings or trigger me in some type of way. And instead of addressing that with them, I would either just cut them off, ghost them, gradually act colder and colder around them until they finally got the hint. Or if I couldn't avoid them, I would just act passive aggressive around them to send a message without really ever sending a message. And that was fucked. It was. So yeah, flash forward to 2023 and things have changed a lot in that department, obviously. Now I just publicly broadcast every thought and feeling I have. So I'm definitely not scared to communicate anymore, but that was something I was scared of. And I had to work on that in therapy. So yeah, next time, if I ever find myself in a situation like that, I'm just gonna say it. I'm just gonna be like, hey Steve, don't call women sluts. Cause that's offensive and I don't like hearing that. Spicy. This next Tinder story is about Kyle, the serial vapor. Now, this one is actually the most recent Tinder date incident and actually the least cringe of all, because remember how I said it amazes me how not self-aware some people are? Well, that's definitely something the last three guys had in common, but this guy? was very self-aware. So much so that he called himself a trash human, which kudos to Carl for doing that, by the way, because it saved me having to find out. And he wasn't lying. He wasn't. Um, there's this quote someone told me once. I don't remember where it originates from, but it goes something like, people show you exactly who they are from the very beginning, as long as you're paying attention. And I was paying attention, baby, on this night. <laughs> and this dude was saying some, uh, some interesting shit. So bit of a background on Kyle. He's mid to late twenties, musician slash bartender, grew up on the Northern beaches, loves a good vape. And I know this cause he was literally vaping in my face throughout the night. Not that I have a problem with vaping in general, but the way he was doing it combined with the words that were coming out of his mouth was particularly obnoxious. So to tie that all together in a neat little bow, he also had that classic sad boy slash fuck boy aesthetic. You know, the beanie, the layered haircut, the fringe that swoops across one side of his face, ripped denim jeans, vans with worn out soles. And I'm not here to make fun of anyone's clothes or anyone's look or anything, but this guy in particular was textbook fuckboy looking. Like everything from his posture, his walk, his smirk, his smart ass fuck the system, fuck gentrification commentary was spot on fuckboy sad boy vibes. So straight off the bat, that's who we're dealing with on this night. So I met up with Kyle at Earl's in Newtown. That's where we started the night. And we were both running late because the weather was awful and traffic was a nightmare. So before I even get there, I'm in the Uber and he's sending me voice notes. And basically in the voice notes, he's telling me, you know, to be honest, I had a pretty wild night last night. I almost forgot about our date tonight, but I'm so glad I remembered because I'm looking at your Instagram photos right now and you look hot as fuck. At this point, my Uber driver's laughing, I'm laughing. Then he sends me another voice note being like, oh, and sorry, I didn't plan too much ahead of time. I also don't look the best right now because I'm a trash human. And then he just sort of quietly laughs to himself. And honestly, he sounded high off his ass. So at this point, I'm thinking this is going to be uh, interesting. So I rock up and he doesn't look as rough as I was expecting based on the voice notes. And he's actually very charming and flirty and has a nice smile. He was throwing out a lot of one-liners though and like common dating questions that just really rolled off the tongue for him very smoothly, which made me think this guy must be a serial dater or serial flirter because this just seems too easy for him. And I was right because he at some point in the night did tell me that he was on pretty much every dating app under the sun and was going out with a bunch of new people pretty much every week, which like I said at the beginning, this guy was very upfront and very himself from the start and seemed to be pretty self-aware of his mild douchiness, which I do respect in the the sense that if you're gonna be that guy, at least be honest about it, you know? And he was wearing that on his sleeve. Anyway, the first half of the night was actually pretty fun. We had a couple of cocktails. He told me his funny bartender stories, all these different characters he's met working at the bar. He asked me a lot of questions about my work as well. And then he found out that I was a journalist and he was like, oh fuck, journalists are the worst. <laughs> And I was like, ooh, okay, well, that's awkward. I mean, to be fair, I guess they can be, but you know who's worse? Real estate agents. <laughs> Real estate agents, prove me wrong. 
prove me wrong. Anyway, he did then ask me what I like to write about. And funnily enough, this date happened about four months before I launched the Sex Talk with Amy podcast. And the concept for this show hadn't even popped into my head yet, but I do remember telling him, you know, I just love to talk about sex, you know? I don't know what to do with that exactly, but I'll figure it out, I guess. And he was like, damn, okay. I was not expecting that answer. <laughs> Tell me more. Anyway, then we went to dinner at Calaveras. Then we went to the bank for more drinks. And we were sitting in the outside balcony area on the second floor. And this is when he was like, mind if I vape? And I'm like, yeah, no worries. What I wasn't expecting was for him to then proceed to vape in my face while he talked a million miles an hour. Cause he was facing me where he was seated and he was pretty close to my face. And he just started vaping and talking and just blowing smoke in my face while he started ranting and raving about the government and Medicare and the police and how gentrification is killing communities or whatever. And look, it's not like he wasn't making any valid points. He was. But the whole scene of him being clearly pretty tipsy at this point and getting really heated on these subject matters with a watermelon vape in his hand, blowing smoke on my face, it was, it was comical. It looked comical for sure. And my eyes were watering from the smoke. Anyway, we did end up making out and this is when I got really upfront and I said to him, you know, I really just wanna fuck, but I'm on my period. And he was like, damn, I don't do period sex. <laughs> that's literally what he sounded like. And I'm like, well, okay, that's fine then. Anyway, we did end up going back to my place regardless. And when the Uber pulled up, he was like, fuck, this is your house? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, fuck, gentrification's a bitch. Again with the gentrification, still going on about gentrification. It's like, mate, I just rent here. I'm not responsible for renovations in this suburb. We go inside, I pour him some whiskey cause he said he wanted another drink and that's all we had. Then I go to the bathroom, come back and he's just walking around the house, picking stuff up, not my stuff, my housemate's stuff, looking at it all confused and then putting it back down. And in the living room, there was this shelf where one of my housemates kept all of these like expensive bottles of bourbon, gin, wine, vodka, all this stuff. And he's picking the bottles up. Thank God he didn't drop anything. And he's like, fuck, how much do you reckon this one costs? And I'm like, fuck, I don't know, mate, you're the bartender. Anyway, then he sees a fender in the living room, like propped up on a stand with an amp next to it. And he makes a beeline for the guitar. And I'm thinking, fuck, um, he better not fuck that up. Anyway, he picks up the guitar, sits on the couch and just starts playing it. He plays one of his originals and he actually sounded really good. It was very cute. He kind of like serenaded me a little. Anyway, guitar goes back on the stand. I'm now straddling his lap. We're making out and like dry humping because I'm on my period and he doesn't want to do anything else. Then eventually he's like, yeah, my mate's playing a gig at the Union Hotel tonight, do you wanna to go to that with me? But at this point, guys, it was getting pretty late. Alcohol was getting to me, I was tired. So I was like, you know what? I think I'm just gonna call it a night if that's okay. And he was like, yeah, no worries. We'll do this again some other time. So then he left, he messaged me the next Arvo wanting to meet up again, but I had to go to Brisbane for work. Then things got really hectic. We tried to schedule something a few times after that, but we could never seem to sync up our schedules. And then we just sort of drifted apart. And yeah, I never met up with him again. Honestly, did I like this guy on a relationship level? No, but I would have liked to add him to my list of roots if he'd been down to and I wasn't on my period. But I guess it wasn't meant to be. The route that got away. <laughs> Say la vie. Question, question, my love. Question. And now. The time has come for me to answer your burning questions. For any newcomers to the show, Ask Amy is a weekly segment we do where I answer your questions sent through via socials or to the podcast email and you get your questions answered anonymously on the show. So if you want to take part, just send an email to hello at sextalkwithamy.com or reach out via Instagram at stwa podcast. And remember, nothing is off limits. Number one. Do you think sex workers lose the real emotional feeling feelings when it comes to unpaid sex. Okay, this is definitely a multi-layered question, um, but I just want to start by saying, you know, everyone's different. Sex worker or not, everyone's different and everyone's emotions or emotional approach to sex is going to be a little different. There are millions of sex workers around the world and I don't know how any of them feel because I'm not in their head, I'm not in their heart, and I don't know what their attachment style is. But with my limited experience and understanding, I would assume that as a sex worker, you 
you'd have to practice emotional detachment, right? So that you can actually have an effective, healthy career, mentally, emotionally, physically, because that kind of work can be very emotionally draining. There's also many different types of relationship dynamics and styles of work in the sex industry. So some sex workers do have lovers or partners outside of performing sexual services for money, and they do feel emotionally attached to those people or feel an emotional connection when they're having sex outside of work, and some of them don't. Um, I actually read a Vice article recently, which I'll link in the show notes, um, and it has some real life recounts from sex workers who talk about the consequences of developing emotional feelings for clients on the job. This one sex worker from California called Hara Lim is quoted saying that some sex workers she knows purposely don't offer a service called the girlfriend experience because of the emotional risk of getting too close. She says sex work can be a lot of intimacy and you spend so much time with these Johns. She says anyone who's involved in this kind of intimate work could potentially develop romantic feelings for their client regardless of their level of experience. And yeah, I'm sure that's very, very true. Honestly though, this question did get me thinking. Can sex ever really be completely emotionless? And is it ever really given for free? And when I say for free, I'm not talking about money necessarily, but when you really think about sex in the context of dating, there is generally some kind of exchange, right? Someone who's interested in sleeping with a the person they're attracted to might invest time, energy, spend money on dates, gifts, etc., in an attempt to woo their sexual interest. Some would even argue that sex itself is a form of currency because it is, in many situations, used as a bargaining chip. For example, when a couple is having a fight, one partner might attempt to seduce the other or offer up sexual favors in an attempt to steer away from the argument. When it comes to emotional attachment though, psychologist Jackie Manning says the ability to engage in emotionless sex or have successful friends with benefits dynamics with someone varies from person to person and it can be dependent on their attachment style, upbringing and personality. In one article, which I'll link in the show notes, Jackie says humans are wired for attachment, but the degree to which people form attachments to others can vary due to your childhood. For example, people with the avoidant attachment style might be more reserved and might not connect with people as deeply as others due to their conditioning and upbringing. On the other hand, she says that people that fall in love easily are risk takers. So they love the feeling of being in love. They love the flow of all the oxytocin and great chemicals, and they realize there can be potential for heartbreak. However, regardless of your attachment style or what your intentions are, Jackie suggests that sexual partners communicate their feelings, needs, and intentions before sex and outside of the bedroom. And this is because your frontal cortex, which is the section of your brain that processes thoughts and logic, is disrupted during sex. On top of that, you also have dopamine running through your system, which lights up your pleasure chemicals. And the final kicker, oxytocin, which according to Jackie, is usually the main reason some people end up unexpectedly forming emotions with the person they're hooking up with. So bottom line, Talk about your intentions and where you're at with your feelings before sex. Communicate with your sexual partner if anything changes for you throughout. And everybody, including sex workers, can catch feelings during sex whether they expected to or not. Number two. How would I find out more about starting a voice seduction slash ASMR slash erotic storytelling OnlyFans platform? Honestly, boo, my advice would be just do your own research. ASMR is popping off right now. The ASMR community is huge and there are plenty of ASMR channels on YouTube, OnlyFans. There's ASMR videos on Pornhub even. There's plenty out there to draw inspiration from and I'm sure you can find plenty of tutorials and resources online as well that will help you start your own ASMR channel. So good luck with that and I hope it works out for you. Three. I'm looking for advice and guidance for my fiance and me in regards to our sex life. We have a wonderful relationship, but we have been in a rut when it comes to sex. For a while, it's been hard for me to be interested in sex. It's not because I'm not attracted to her. I just don't feel like I have the drive. I don't know if it's because we don't try anything new or experiment. I think we're both afraid too, because we are both on the bigger side. I also suffer from stress and anxiety and take medication for it, but a small dose. So I am able to be excited when we are playing. I just feel real lost as to what to do because I know it does hurt her when I don't show affection. 
okay, well, first of all, I'm sorry to hear that you're going through this in your relationship right now. Everything that you mentioned is very common in terms of other people having similar experiences. And thankfully, it's also addressable. So in the last episode of the podcast, we had Melbourne-based sexologist Daniel DiPietro on, and we actually talked about mismatched libidos in relationships and how sex drive can be impacted by certain kinds of medications. And if you haven't checked out that episode yet, I definitely recommend giving it a listen. I'll leave a link to it in the show notes below. But basically, libido can fluctuate for many different reasons, right? Stress, anxiety, medication, feeling like you're stuck in a rut, all these kinds of things. And something that Daniel has noticed when treating couples who have mismatched desire is that there's typically a breakdown in communication. So a lack of communication or a lack of understanding of each other's needs or desires. And a second big thing he's noticed is that the sexual activity that is happening between these couples has a sense of predictability, just like you said, with, you know, feeling like you're in a rut when it comes to sex. And in these situations, what he discusses with these couples is trying to figure out what it is that's actually missing from the relationship. Is it the frequency or is it the quality? And once you kind of delve into that question, it's important to open up a dialogue between you two on what makes it a quality experience for each of you. What are you needing more? more of within the relationship. Say for example, if one of you is content with having sex once a month or once a fortnight and the other person is like, well, actually I'd like to have sex once a week. Then you can look into, well, is there a middle ground we can find there? Is that frequency movable or adjustable if we can increase the emotional intimacy between us and also find ways to improve the quality of our sexual experiences? So as far as increasing emotional intimacy goes, there are ways to do that during intimate experiences with your partner that aren't necessarily penetrative because of course not every sexual encounter has to lead to penetration. You can try extended foreplay or another intimate activity. And one exercise Daniel talked about last episode that you can try is facing your partner and you place one hand on your partner's heart and they place one hand on your heart and you just breathe together in sync. And being in sync with each other in that way while your partner's hand is placed against that vulnerable organ, it can create a sense of connectedness. And doing that for just five minutes per day, whether it ends up leading to a sexual encounter or not, could be really helpful in terms of reigniting your sense of connectedness with each other. Another thing that you mentioned is that you know it does hurt her when you don't show affection. And it's really important to acknowledge that and communicate about that with her. But also people like to show affection or receive affection in different ways. And this is where the five love languages comes in. And essentially, the five love languages describe five ways that people express and also receive love in a relationship. There's words of affirmation, quality time, physical touch, acts of service, and receiving gifts. And in a relationship, when you know your partner's love language and they know yours, it can be really helpful in the sense that it gives you a guide and a better understanding of how it is exactly that you can make them feel loved and appreciated. And if you don't know what your love language is, there is a love language quiz on the official five love languages page. So I'll leave a link to that in the show notes below if you wanna check it out. But basically, say for example, your partner's love language is words of affirmation. So if that's the case, you know, letting her know that you love her, you appreciate her, assuring her that you are in fact attracted to her and that being in a relationship with her feels wonderful to you, just like you phrased it in your question. That might be something that would be very affirming and comforting for her to receive. And letting her know that your low sex drive has nothing to do with your lack of attraction to her or feeling unhappy in the relationship itself. And then expressing to her the fact that you are open to trying new things and asking her how she feels about that or if there is anything in particular she would like to try. But if that conversation is proving to be difficult to have, or maybe she doesn't know, or maybe you don't know what other new things you guys could possibly try, a fun way to open up that dialogue or ease into that would be, say, for example, a kinky card game. You know, there's this one true or false card game, for example, called Kinky Humans, which I'll leave a link to in the show notes. But basically, there's all these different statement cards, which have quite frankly, given me a ton of new ideas for things I want to try in the bedroom. And it can help you dive into some new fantasies to explore together. Like for example, using a remote controlled vibrator on each other in public or having sex in the shower or using handcuffs during sex or trying sensory deprivation or trying out a sex swing or trying edging or temperature play with wax or ice cubes or all these different kinds of things that are out there. You can also try reading erotic stories or erotic fan fiction or listening to erotic audio stories together for some inspiration and seeing what you can discover from there. 
You also mentioned medication as well, which you take in a small dose to manage stress and anxiety. And something we talked about last episode was SNRIs, which are a class of medications that are used to treat depression, anxiety, and some other conditions. Now, obviously I have no idea what medication you take, but medication in general can definitely impact libido. But SNRIs in particular, as Daniel discussed last week, can impact sexual desire and also erectile functionality. However, you did say that you are able to be excited when engaging with your partner sexually. So if I were to assume that you were referring to erectile functionality there, then that doesn't seem to be an issue for you. Correct me if I'm wrong, obviously, but that's what I'm gathering from that. But either way, anxiety and stress can definitely impact sexual pleasure and function. And things like performance anxiety can definitely come into play as well with that. And as Daniel talked, about last week, removing the goal aspect of sex, whether the goal be orgasm or penetration, that can alleviate some of the pressure you may feel with regard to performance and just instead letting things happen and just taking things slow and taking more time to build desire or build up to penetration as you go along. Because the thing is, sex can be clumsy, sex can be non-penetrated and intimacy comes in many forms. So maybe try setting some time aside and explore some sexual things that are non-penetrated. Like for example, exploring each other's erogenous zones or kissing naked or cuddling naked or trying out role play or bringing sex toys into the mix. Focus more on the connectivity aspect of it, the fun aspect of it, the emotional aspect of it, the quality aspect of it. And hopefully that will shift the focus away from performance or achievement or penetration or orgasm or being able to maintain an erection all the way through and just let it be clumsy, you know? You also mentioned a concern regarding body size. You said, I think we're both afraid because we are both on the bigger side. And obviously when it comes to having quality sexual experiences, feeling comfortable and being able to derive pleasure from the positions you're in is a really important part of the experience. And everybody deserves to feel good and feel comfortable no matter their size. And if you're concerned about weight or size having an impact on that, certain sex positions are reportedly more ideal or more comfortable for people who are plus size. And there's all these different articles online that List, you know what these positions are and describe how they can help enhance your sexual experiences but of course everyone is different and these are just suggestions so you may need to explore and find what works for you and your partner but just as an example positions like doggy style or cowgirl can be good if you're concerned about placing too much weight or pressure on the other person like you might do in say missionary for example you can also try having sex in the spooning position which is sweet and intimate but doesn't require placing too much weight on your partner you can also also place a pillow underneath your hips or your partner's hips for added support and comfortability. Also, if you or your partner have any sort of difficulty supporting yourselves on your hands and knees, you can stack pillows beneath you or you can use a piece of sex furniture called a wedge to hold yourself up. So what I'll do is I'll link some resources below on sex position suggestions for plus sized individuals and also maybe some sex pillows or wedges that you can look into trying if you feel like that might help you guys. So overall, I hope you find some of these suggestions helpful for what you're going through. Of course, a disclaimer, I'm not a professional on any of these matters. So if at some point down the track, you feel like it might be worthwhile for you or your partner to consult a sexologist and discuss these issues with them for some extra guidance, I would definitely recommend doing that as well. Four. Would you ever have sex with someone's dad? <laughs> I mean, I guess it depends on the daddy. <laughs> No, seriously though, um, it depends on who it is and it depends on the age gap as well. So if it was a friend's dad, absolutely not because that's crossing an awkward line and I wouldn't want to hurt my friend. But if it was a man in his 20s or 30s who happens to be a father and is single, emphasis on the single part because I'm not trying to do any home wrecking here. I don't want to create an Ariana Grande, Ethan Slater sort of situation if you know what I'm talking about. I'm not looking to steal someone's dad or someone's partner. I'm looking to fuck someone's dad. <laughs> And I feel like that's an important distinction to make. So yeah, if the daddy was right, if the attraction was right, if the chemistry was right, then yeah, I'd fuck a dad. I'd fuck the shit out of a dad. Are you kidding me? Let's go. Five. What do you think about robots replacing sex workers? What do I think about it? Um, that's fucked. No, um, I don't think robots are replacing sex workers necessarily, at least not at this present time. That being said, obviously in recent years, advancements in robotics and AI have infiltrated the sex toy industry, leading to the development of AI sex robots that seem to be getting more and more realistic every year. And there's definitely a global market for that. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that necessarily, especially when you factor in that 
that in some parts of the world, sex work is illegal or less readily available. And so for people seeking that kind of service to have a robotic alternative that feels realistic enough, I think is a good thing mostly. I think as AI sex robots become more prevalent over time, only then will we be able to see if it does end up having a significant enough impact on the sex work industry that it becomes quite clear that some sex workers jobs may be in jeopardy as a result of that. But I still do think that we are a while away from that happening. And I don't know what everyone's going to want in a few years or what the level of social acceptance regarding AI's integration with society is going to be. I imagine it will be quite divided, but my intuition tells me that there will always be a market for human sex work, but there will also always be a market for AI generated sex toys and bots and things like that. But I don't think one will necessarily completely destroy the other. That wraps up this week's episode, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in and for sending in your questions. The next episode of Sex Talk with Amy will be airing on Wednesday, the 23rd of August. So get keen for that and come and celebrate hump day with me. But until then, if you're loving the podcast and want to stay up to date, give us a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and hit the download button on this episode to revisit your favorite moments. If you enjoy the show, let us know by leaving a review and five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Hope you guys have a beautiful week ahead. Keep it fun, keep it fresh, keep it safe, keep it sexy, and I'll see you guys next time. This is Amy Davidson, signing off.